Okay, in our final problem, where we're using critical points in the introduction to finding extreme values. Um, this one, the test de resistance, the fin, the last one of the ones that we're dealing with, all right, is what students dread the most, the old piecewise function problem. Ooh, this is right around Halloween. Even though I don't believe in Halloween, um, it's still kind of spooky. All right, we said a lot of students. Now, when you're dealing with a piecewise function, um, it's probably always good to maybe try to figure out what this graph is and identify what types of graphs we have. All right, and understanding how piecewise functions work. Now, remember when we dealt with piecewise functions that we are talking about different pieces of a graph. So when we have this, all right, um, first function, we are only using the values of this piecewise function. All right, only the values that are right here. I'm trying to highlight, all right, that our all x values are less than or equal to 1. So, when we're going through and figuring this out, this once again doesn't have any endpoints, all right, but it does have a point where, all right, it changes, where there could be discontinuity, okay? So, we want to keep that in mind. But the first off, in order to figure out the critical points of a piecewise graph, to do this analytically, we're going to find the critical points, okay? Critical points. Now, to find the critical points, we're going to take our first graph, I'm going to call it y1, and we're going to take the derivative of that. And we're going to try to identify any critical points that are in the domain of that, or in that interval, where it is affected by this type of graph. All right, so I'm going to find the domain of this, and I should get negative 1 half x, all right, minus 1 half, all right, and I'm going to set that equal to 0. Because once again, critical points are when y prime equals 0, and where y prime does not exist. If we didn't get that in the last ones, all right, that's what a critical value is, critical point. All right, so we're going to identify this, and where does this equal, all right, um, 0? Well, you can see if you solve this, x is going to equal 0 at negative 1. Okay, at negative 1. We look at this and say, okay, is negative 1 in this domain? And the answer is yes. Okay, so since it is, what I can do is I can find out what this value is as one of my critical points. So I'm going to find out what y of negative 1 is by plugging it into all right, this equation. When I get that, I have negative 1 fourth, I have positive 1 half, and plus 15 fourths. Do my little math, negative 1 fourth plus um, 2 fourths. Plus 15, that's convenient, I get 15 fourths there. All right. And then it turns into 16 fourths. Another convenience. All right, 4. All right, 4 is one of my possible values, all right, maximums of this function. Now, in thinking that this is a parabola, all right, and knowing that parabolas look like this, all right, I am hypothesizing, or probably with direct accuracy, since it has a negative leading coefficient, it is smiling down, and therefore this is going to be a relative, waiting for it, yeah, you can see it yourself, a relative max. All right, this is a relative maximum. Okay. We go to our next function, okay, and... I'll, I'm coming back to this one point right here, in just one second, all right, where that could be. All right, we'll come back to that. What we have right here is now we're going to look at our second function, okay, which is going to be this. All right, once again, keeping in mind, all right, this is what only intervals we have. So I'm going to once again find my critical values. I'll change this and use green for this particular one. All right, I'll move it over here. And we're going to be using this one by finding... And I'll say y sub 2, all right, and find the derivative of that, and set it equal to 0. Well, here we have 3x squared minus 12x plus 8, all right, and we'll set that equal to 0, right, like so. And we have to figure out, okay, is this one factorable? And we can go through and think of some different factors. Um, 3 and 8, um, if we want to take some time. Minus, and then we have probably 2 and 4, uh, 8, 2, and let's just try this. Oops, that's going to be a 1, I apologize. A 1, and this is going to be a 2, and how about a 2 and a 4? Am I that right? No, that wouldn't work out. All right, I'm going to pause it for one second. I know this is embarrassing. I'm going to pause for it and think about what these different values would be. All right. And you can think about that as well. And we'll come back and figure that out. 
All right, after further review, and after your thing, it does not work out. I guess I wasn't going crazy. All right, and as you can see, I did not do this problem beforehand. So what we have is we're going to have to use a quadratic formula to help us figure this one out. So we take the opposite of b, which would be 12, plus or minus the square root of b squared. So 144 minus 4 times a, which is 3, times 8. All right, right there. Okay, we have 140, oops, over 2a, which would be 6. So we have 144 minus uh, 12 times 8. Um, and that's going to give us 896, I believe. Yes, all right. Oops, let's get the quadratic four. 144, and then we got plus or minus 12 over 6, and we can continue on, whew, wow, all right, 12 plus or minus, take that, and we have 144, so 44, 48, is that right, I think so, 48, four, yes, all right, 48 right there, divide by 6. Okay, we can take this, and we can uh, take out a 16, I believe. Am I right? All right, take my little factor tree over here. All right, 4, and then we get 12, and 12, we got 4 and 3. Yes, even calculus teachers do factor trees. All right, so finally what we have is 12 plus or minus. All right, what we have is a square root of this, or that, or that. So we have 4 um, squared to 3 over 6. Okay, simplifying this one, wow, this one is complex. We have, um, take out a 2 and 6, we have 2 plus or minus, all right, 2 squared to 3 over 3. Okay, so those are our possible values, okay, those are our possible values. Now, probably want to take out your calculator and find out what those actual values are going to be. If we have this right here, I'll say quit this, and we'll take 2. All right, and find out that's in the domain of what we want. And then we have 2 times the square root of 3. Oops, I want to go back there. And delete that. Delete that. All right, and let's try this again. Square root. There we go. A 3. Take that out. Out, and then divide that by 3. That's going to be... Go to, of course. All right, that one. There we go. Let's try it again. And we get this, which is going to give us approximately 3.154. All right, 3.154. And we can find out our other value by plugging in the same thing. Go to second entry. Take that. I'm just going to move this over and put a minus sign in there. Right there, and press enter. And what we got? Go to. Oh, man. Two minus. There we go. And then we press enter. And we get that. Point eight. Point eight something. However, we are only taking values that are greater than one. Greater than one. So this one won't count. And this is our other critical value. Okay. So bring that all up here. And then we have this one right here where we have y, all right, bring that out, and we can plug that into our, our calculator to figure out that answer, okay? So if you go to your calculator and you punch in, all right, x cubed minus 6x squared, all right, plus 8x, all right, and we go to, if you go to your table, and we, I have it as entering in 3.154. And press enter. All right. And 3.154. And we get some sort of crazy answer. All right. That right there. And I'll just take it out, put it right like so, and circle it. And that would be our response right there. Okay. So we can see we have that value. All right, and now the question is, does one work? All right, does one work? Now, in order to figure out one, we have to figure out if this is, um, has continuity at one, because there might be a counter cusp or whatnot. So the final critical point is where we have f prime, all right, where that does not exist. 
that would possibly occur here at 1. In order to figure that out, we're going to plug 1 into y prime of 1, and we're also going to compare that to y prime of 2. If they equal, it does, it's fine. If they don't equal, then it doesn't exist. So when we do that, all right, oops, so, all right, let's just take that out. I plug in a 1 in here, and I get negative 1 fourth. All right, and then I'm going to compare that to negative 1 fourth. I plug it into here, and what do we have? Um, whoa, hello. Maybe I should even check out to make sure they have the actual same values. All right, we have one here, and what we have is three minus 12 plus eight. And we realize that we have this other value of um, 11, negative one. All right, negative one. Okay. And negative 1 does not equal negative 1 fourth. Okay. Or actually, hang on. Did I do this wrong? I apologize. I got one half. Negative 1 half plus negative 1 half is negative 1. Oh my goodness, I can't even add. So they do equal each other. So this is not the case. They are actually, it is, does have continuity at those two values. So these are specific values, a relative max here. And it appears that since this is going to be a negative value, that this would be a relative min. Okay, so hopefully you got that. All right, the key thing with when you're dealing with uh, piecewise functions is find the critical points at each individual function individually. Make sure that is in the proper domain. All right, and then make sure you test this value. All right, at the endpoint of the domain to see if it doesn't exist. In this case, it did. All right. Well, hopefully this helps you out in understanding how to find critical points that will allow you to find extreme values. Good luck, God bless, and I'll, I'll see you and talk to you later.